Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking time to join us for this important conversation about some of the legislative advances you've made possible in the past year. My name is Shoni Field, and I'm the Chief Development Officer at the BCSPCA, and I'm very happy to be your host for our annual Telephone Town Hall. I can already see that we've got hundreds of animal lovers joining us. It's just like an old-fashioned town hall meeting, and people are still filing in. It'll take a few minutes for everybody to join us on the call. Um, tonight, I'm joined by Craig Daniel, our CEO. Welcome, Craig. Thanks, Shoni. I can't believe it's that time of the year again. I'm really looking forward to chatting with everyone tonight. Me too. I, I really love the chance to be part of these telephone town halls and chat with our supporters about how we're, we're helping animals together. We're also joined by Marcy Moriarty, our Chief Prevention and Enforcement Officer. Thanks for joining us, Marcy. Thanks, Joni. I'm very happy to be here again this year and looking forward to chatting with the caring folks on the phone tonight who make our work possible. Absolutely. Those of you on the phone tonight are some of our most loyal friends to animals in need, and we're tremendously grateful for your kindness. So I just want to say if you want to get in line to ask a question or provide input, just press star 3 on your phone at any time. We'll try to get to as many of you as possible. And if we don't get to you, you'll have the opportunity to leave your question at the end of the call and we'll follow up in the days to come. If you get cut off at any point in the show, you can reach us again by dialing one 229 8493 and entering the code 112 561. I'll repeat that again if you want to grab a piece of paper to jot it down. That's dialing 1-877-229-8493 and entering the code 112561. If you're just joining us tonight, welcome. I'm Shoni Field, the host of tonight's BCSPCA Telephone Town Hall. I'm here with our CEO, Craig Daniel, and Marcy Moriarty, our Chief Prevention and Enforcement Officer. We're really excited to be meeting with you, the animal's most loyal friends, for discussion about some of the monumental changes that you made possible in the last year. Again, for those of you just joining us, I'm your host, Shoni Field, and I'd like to remind you that if at any time you have a question or want to provide input, just press star 3 on your phone. You'll be put in line to ask your question live on the air. And if you don't want to ask your question live or we weren't able to get to you, you'll have the opportunity to leave a message at the end of the call, and we'll go back to you over the next week or so. So just a reminder, if you get cut off at any point in the show, you can reach us again by dialing 1-877-229-8493 and entering the code 112561. So since we're here tonight talking about the successes in animal welfare laws, I'm interested to see which of you may have joined us uh, by speaking for animals and c calling for legislative change. So we're going to have our first poll. Uh, when we approach government for policy or legislative changes to improve animal welfare, it's really helpful that we can demonstrate public support for those changes that we're calling for. So here at the BCSPCA, we have email and online action alerts. And when animal lovers like yourself participate in the action alerts, it demonstrates that people are aware of and care about the, the issues where we're, we're calling for change. So we're wondering if you've heard about our action alerts. And I'm going to repeat the polling options just uh, twice, just in case you didn't catch them the first time. So press 1 for yes, and I participate in them. Uh, press 2 if yes, but you don't participate in the action alerts. Press 3 for no, but I'm interested in knowing more. And press 4 for no, and I'm not interested in knowing more. And press 5 for I don't have access to email or internet. So again, I'll repeat those options. We're asking about our action alerts. Press 1 if you've heard about them and you participate in them. Press 2 if you've heard about them but you don't participate in them. Press 3 for um, no, you haven't heard about them, but you're interested in knowing more and four for you're not interested in knowing more, and five if you don't have access to email or internet. So we'll share those answers with you as soon as they've all come in. Now, as, as I had previously mentioned, I have BCSPCA CEO Craig Daniel and Marcy Moriarty, our Chief Prevention and Enforcement Officer, here with me, and we're just waiting for some others to join us on the call. While we're waiting, Craig, perhaps you can share with us about how the, the second year of the, the new strategic plan is going. 
Thanks, Shoni, and again, good evening, everyone. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's already a busy time. We're into the second year of our new strategic plan, and uh, lots of activities going on. I think one of the things that, as an organisation that um, is committed to enforcing the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, uh, it's really exciting to see the continued uh, build out of our special constable team. And so, over the course of the last year and uh, throughout this year as well. We're adding additional special constables, particularly in more rural uh, communities around the province. This is an area where we know we, we need more constables, and so I'm really excited about being able to add uh, constables there. The other area that I'll just quickly chat about is um, the work that we're doing in the area of youth education. And ultimately, you know, these are future advocates and champions, and uh, I'm really thrilled by the the ability that we've had right across communities in British Columbia by increasing the number of kids attending our summer camps. And uh, it's wonderful to see how that program has grown over the years. So those are just two uh, uh, initiatives that we have ongoing. Thanks, Craig. I think those really get to, you know, we want to stop current cruelty and prevent future cruelty. And those those two initiatives really speak to that. I'm going to go back now to our uh, the, our poll we asked over the action alerts. So I'm really excited to see that 54% of you have participated in our action alerts before, and uh, and we've got 8% who've uh, heard of them and haven't participated yet, and uh, 28% who are interested in knowing more. So we'll get you out some information on that, and. Um, and then 2% who not interested at this time, and 8% who don't have access to email or internet. So it's really interesting to get a, a sense of who's on the call. I think now we've had pretty much everyone uh, join us who's going to, so let's get things started. So welcome uh, again, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Shoni Field, Chief Development Officer at the BCSPCA, and I'm your host for tonight's annual BCSPCA Telephone Town Hall. I have our CEO, Craig Daniel, and Marcy Moriarty, our Chief Prevention and Enforcement Officer, here with me. And we're really thrilled to welcome you this evening. Our telephone town halls are really a unique opportunity for us to, to share a conversation with some of our most loyal supporters who are spread across the province, and we, we all come together for really what I think is quite a special evening. And tonight, we're going to talk about some of the legislative changes that you've made possible on both a national and a local level. Uh, throughout the call, you just press star 3 on your phone if you'd like to get in line to ask a question. And if you don't want to ask a question live on air, you'll be able to leave a t personal message at the end of the call, and we'll get back to you. So to start the evening, I'm pleased to introduce Craig Daniel, our CEO. As many of you already know, Craig joined the BCSPCA in 2002 as the General Manager of Cruelty Investigations and has been our Chief Executive Officer since 2003. Prior to the BCSPCA, Craig was Director of Investigations at the Ontario SPCA and worked with the United Nations providing legal counsel on matters relating to, among other things, animal protection. Craig? Thanks very much, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And also thank you for the incredible impact that your generosity has on the lives of uh, our province's most vulnerable animals. It's certainly a great pleasure for me to work in partnership with you, and I feel blessed to be in the position that I'm in. So many of you have actually been supporting the BCSPCA for far longer than I've been with the organization, so thanks so much for making that happen. It's certainly wonderful to speak with those of you that have been part of the BCSPCA for so long, uh, especially given the insights that you have to our history. And, and speaking of that history, um, one of the things we're really excited about is that 2020 marks the 125th anniversary of the British Columbia SPCA. That makes us uh, the province's oldest charity. We were started in 1895 by a group of animal lovers, much like uh, the group that's, uh, that's here on the call tonight. We began as in response to concern for the plight of working horses and, an, and working animals throughout uh, British Columbia. And since then, of course, we've grown so much and are now making strides to improve laws and legislation to help animals locally, provincially and nationally. And uh, in fact, we have someone with us tonight that's been on the front line of those very le same legislative changes over the last 15 years. Marcy, 
Thanks, Craig. Uh, definitely, sometimes I can't believe it's been that long. I'm very happy to be here tonight with everyone who works with us at the BCSPCA to improve the laws around animal welfare. Um, as Craig had mentioned, I joined the SPCA in 2005, and I've always said I got my dream job, and I can still say that 15 years later. Um, prior to that, I had been um, studied animal biology and law and was called to the bar. And uh, since then, since 2012, I've been leading the cruelty investigations um, and science and policy team. But I have to say that 2019 was really a monumental year in regards to seeing some big changes um, for animal welfare, especially at the federal level. It really was. We had uh, two big pieces of legislation passed. And the, the first was the ban on keeping cetaceans in captivity, right? Yeah, that's correct, Shoni. We had been working very closely with lawmakers for some time on this bill. In fact, uh, four years. So it's a great day when the Senate passed it. Can you share a little bit about the bill for the, the people on the phone? Absolutely. So this was Bill S-203, and this bill not only bans the capture and confinement of whales and dolphins, it also criminalizes the breeding of captive cetaceans, which uh, is a North American first. Uh, the bill amends the Criminal Code uh, of Canada to make keeping cetaceans in captivity an offense. And if any of you have seen the documentary Blackfish, um, you're very well aware of some of the concerns around keeping cetaceans um, in captivity. The the Criminal Code all was amended also, um, or the sorry, the bill amended also several other acts to prohibit capturing a cetacean and to require a permit to import or export a cetacean. This is a huge move forward. Um, for animal welfare and, anim and cetaceans in, in Canada. As mentioned, we've known for some time that cetaceans are highly intelligent, social, um, deep diving species whose needs absolutely cannot be met in a tank. Now, don't worry, the bill still allows rescue organizations to help cetaceans that are injured or in distress and relieve them um, of that distress and then release them when they're healthy. It's such great news, and it was a really a victory what this community animal lovers was was able to achieve that. Craig, could you share with us a bit about the other huge legislative change we saw last year? Yeah, happy to, Shoni. Thanks so much. So this is Bill C-84, and this is the one that provides better protection for animals from acts of bestiality and from animals being used in animal fighting. So under the updated legislation, anyone convicted of bestiality would be added to Canada's natural uh, National Sex Offenders Registry, and be, can be banned from owning animals. It also cracks down on animal fighting. Uh, the changes include making an offence to build and maintain an arena for the purposes of animal fighting, and the law now applies to anyone, and I will quote this, in any manner, manner encourages, aids, promotes, arranges, assists at, receives money for, or takes part in the fighting or baiting of animals. So very broad definition. And I have to say, you know, we're absolutely thrilled that these updates have finally been made. It, it's been a long time coming, but it was truly a team effort to get this uh, there. It, it really was a team effort. And, uh, you know, in the process of a bill being passed, there's a, a comment period where the public has an opportunity to make comments. And for all of us here, it was really exciting to see that 70% of those comments were coming from BCSPCA supporters. Um, that was during a campaign organized by our partners at Humane Canada. So thank you to everyone on the phone who really played a big part in making that happen. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to quickly jump in there and, and say, you know, we've worked very closely with our national partner, Humane Canada, to put forward a national campaign for Bill C-84 to petition MPs in the Prime Minister's office. And I have to say that uh, it, I'm exceptionally proud of how vocal and, and passionate animal lovers in British Columbia are. And, and it's not just on this issue, it's on so many issues. We see British Columbia leading the way, and, and I really do believe that's the result of passionate animal lovers here in the province. We really are lucky to have uh, such a fantastic group of people uh, working together, uh, helping to improve the lives of animals. So it's it's really wonderful to be part of. I know everyone has questions, and we want to go to the to phone to take some questions. So we have Diane on the phone from Roberts Creek. Uh, go ahead, Diane. Yes, I just wanted to know why some of the vets here could not give 
some pro bono work for people on low incomes because I was helping at the shelter the other day and a very beloved Staffordshire had to be turned in because they couldn't afford the high price of the vet uh, operating on the dog and the dog was heartbroken and the people were heartbroken. I, I think it's, why can't they give a bit? I mean, they make a lot of money. Uh, maybe I'll try and that's Craig. I'll I'll try and answer that. So uh, thank you so much, Diane, for your call and for your support. Uh, you know, so I, I do want to say that uh, we're very fortunate that we do enjoy a, an exceptional relationship with the veterinary community here in British Columbia. And uh, uh, you know, we've actually looked at um, with the veterinary community, they donate more than a million dollars a year in services to the BCSPCA. So we're very uh, thankful for the support that we get from from veterinarians. Uh, I, I will say as well that that uh, in in my experience, most veterinarians actually do set aside time to provide for uh, low income clients. Obviously, I can't speak for every veterinary clinic, but I, I know that that is something that veterinarians um, feel a, a, a passion to to support. And and we're seeing the other really good thing I would say is that. We're seeing younger uh, veterinarians, recently graduated veterinarians, providing more and more of this work. We, we at the BCSPCA, we've recognized that um, as an organization ourselves, this is an area that we need to do more work in. And our new strategic plan um, is, is focused over the course of the next few years on trying to be able to provide more support for vulnerable animals and more support for individuals uh, who, uh, from low-income uh, communities because we recognize the value of the human-animal bond and we want to make sure that there's as many opportunities for animals to stay with their guardians as possible. And so um, this is this an issue uh, I would say that we continue to talk to veterinarians on and, and, and the responses so far have been really good. Thank you. Thanks, Diane, for, for your question. We have Mary from Victoria on the line. Mary, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Mary. Good evening. Good evening. Go ahead with your question. It was uh, in con for spading animals uh, that are not in your care. Do you sort of promote spading uh, with vets in the area where the animals are, or is it? I'm not sure exactly how it works. Uh, thanks, Mary. I'll take this. It's Marcy here. So, um, absolutely, you've really hit on one of the basic parts of our mission work, and one of the the biggest um, barriers to. Uh, seeing good welfare overall is the whole pet overpopulation issue. Um, of course, at the BCSBCA, we do ensure that all of our animals that we adopt out are spayed and neutered. But we also look, as you mentioned, to what can we do in the communities um, for, to assist uh, animal owners um, to provide this very important um, first step um, for their animals. So we do have, we operate low-cost spay and neuter clinics um, in three different communities. And we also are very active in a variety of outreach reach work um, that focuses on this area. We, um, we provide grants to other small um, uh, animal welfare or rescue organizations or municipalities or First Nations groups who are undertaking spay neuter um, within their own community or um, trap neuter return um, programs. And we also uh, do our own outreach um, within the community, providing those low-cost spay neuter um, uh, work for, for individuals within a community with the goal of really decreasing um, intake into shelters and uh, pet overpopulation. And honestly, that's some of our um, basic mission work that is so important, but we really can't do that without um, the supporters like yourself. So thank you so much. Thanks, Mary, for your question. I think next we have Harold on the phone. Harold? Yes, here I am. Hi, great. You have a okay. question for us. Well, if you have a minute, I can tell you a really good success story first. About a year and a half ago, we adopted a dog from the Salmon Arm. We're on Vancouver Island. We adopted a dog from the Salmon Arm shelter. And he was a 10-year-old Akbash, which is a livestock guardian dog. And he was big and old and hairy, and he had been in, the, in your care for quite a while. He has been absolutely wonderful. He is just, he's just the best, most handsome dog in the world. 
and he's fit into our rural lifestyle out here in Merville on Vancouver Island quite nicely. So I just wanted to give a big shout out to uh, Victoria, on, and um, who is a shelter manager over there at Salmon Arm, and just tell her that Conrad, his name, is very happy and he's healthy and he's doing great. Oh, that's really amazing. I, we love to hear the, the happy stories of the, sounds like uh, Conrad found just the right home for, for him. Did, yeah. did you have a question? Yes, I have a question. Um, in, in the recent Country Life in BC newspaper, I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but they've got a lot of animal welfare articles in there. And one of the most recent ones was about dairy, the dairy industry, um, about the separation of young calves almost the day after they're born. Uh, so to get more milk from the mother. And I wonder if you're doing any work on research or education around that topic. Uh, it's Craig. Pipes. I'll, uh, I'll jump in. So thank you for your question. Uh, really great question. So um, I'm, I'm by no means a, a farm animal expert, but what I will tell you is that uh, we do have a team, uh, a farm animal welfare team, uh, who do work uh, and work in partnership with uh, the University of British Columbia's Animal Welfare Program. Um, and uh, so very specifically, some of the things that we're involved in is working at the national level with our national partner, Humane Canada, in developing things like the, uh, the National Codes of Practice. And so this is essentially what helps to set the, the generally accepted uh, practices of animal management. And as an organization, we, we are very much committed to advancing um, science-based animal welfare. And so over the course of the, the last 10 to 15 years, we've been very active, whether it's on the dairy file or whether it's on um, codes of practice relating to, to, to swine or, or, di or beef cattle and, and chicken and broilers. Uh, and this is going to be a, a continued initiative for the BCSPCA uh, in the future. Really great questions. Uh, just a reminder to everybody throughout the call, you can press star 3 on your phone if you'd like to get in line to ask Craig or Marcy a question. Uh, before we go any further, though, I think the animal lovers on the phone would, with us tonight would love getting an update on BC's emergency legislation. Marcy, you met with the government a couple of weeks ago. Can you share with us uh, about your meeting with them? Of course, Shoni. So, yeah, as you mentioned, the BC government had invited the BCSPCA to share our recommendations um, with respect to emergency preparedness legislation uh, at a meeting um, uh, with the province's emergency um, legislation team. So as it currently stands, BC's emergency preparedness um, policies and legislation does not require local authorities um, or municipalities to include domestic animals in their emergency planning, response, or support services. And this absolutely um, can have serious consequences for both humans and animals. And you know, we only have to look um, to uh, Australia and the terrible images um, of the fires there and the animal issues um, that, that we saw this year to, to see how this can really hit home. <coughs> so what we did is um, we went out to the public uh, through that action alert that was mentioned at the beginning of uh, the show tonight. And within a two-week period, we received more than 23,000 um, animal lover signatures saying that they wanted to have animals included in emergency legislation. Wow. Thank you to everybody on the phone who signed that. It's great, really great to have such a strong show of support in such a short time. It's absolutely huge um, to be able to go to government and, and show that kind of support because that's what um, really helps motivate and see this types of change. So thank you again to everybody who joined us in signing this petition. Uh, so when we did meet with government on January 27th, um, we, we absolutely, they listened to our our points and our, and our considerations, and we're, we're definitely cautiously optimistic that animals will receive um, greater consideration under BC's new emergency management plan. Good to hear. Uh, do you know when we'll hear back on this? Well, they were uh, consulting with a number of stakeholders, and they've indicated that um, they will be uh, providing a report back on um, the stakeholder feedback, and they'll get back when the legislature starts up in autumn. Okay. I'm really happy to hear that this, this is being considered, and I'm, I was so pleased to see how many uh, supporters signed on to uh, put, put their voice behind that with such an active group of vocal animal lovers. 
um, it's we're we're it's really great um, because that's uh, really helps us work for change. I think uh, we want to give people another chance to weigh in uh, on this topic. Marcy, would you like to take this this poll question? Sure, Shoni. So what I'd like to do is ask those on the phone, knowing that disaster and emergencies can happen at any time, I am wondering if you have an emergency plan for your animals. So I'm going to give five options, and again, I'll repeat the options in case you miss them. Uh, so the question is, I'm wondering if you have an emergency plan for your animals. So you can press one for no, but I'm going to look into creating one so that I'm prepared. Two, no, but I'd like some guidance from the BCSPCA to help me be ready. Press three for sort of, I have a plan, but no kit ready yet. Four, for yes, I have a plan and an emergency kit ready to go at any time. And five, for I currently don't have any animals in my life, but I'm interested in helping my friends and family prepare. So again, press one for no, but I'm looking to create one soon. Two, for no, but I'd like some guidance from the SPCA on how to help me get ready. Three, for sort of, I have a plan, but no kit. And four, for yep, I'm on it, I've got the emergency kit ready. And five, for I don't have any animals, but I'm interested in helping my friends and family prepare. We'll come back to the results in a bit, and I'd love to hear from um, some of the people on the phone what they think about these and other animal welfare priorities. So why don't we go to some more questions? Great. Uh, I think next up we have Brianna in Langley on the line. Brianna, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Oh, wonderful. Hi. You have a question for us tonight. I do. Um, I'm a vegan myself, so I don't eat any animals or animal animal byproducts, but my question is about the quality of care towards animals when they are being transported for slaughter. Um, I've heard that they can be in trucks for days without food or water and wanted to know if any action had been taken for that. Mm. Marcy, do you want to take that one? Hi, Brianna. Um, thanks for that question. Absolutely, you raise a very important um, animal welfare issue that has been, you know, top of mind and raised um, for people in BC and across Canada because, of course, transportation issues affect um, not only uh, animals in BC, but um, animals being transported across borders, across Canada. I'm I'm very proud to be part of an organization like the BCSPCA, which is the only um, SPCA or humane study across Canada who has a dedicated farm animal um, team. And the, one of the major uh, priorities for that farm animal team is to be advocating um, on behalf of farm animals for science-based animal welfare improvements to legislation. Um, we do that in a number of ways, being part of, I think, Craig mentioned before, the codes of practice uh, for al animals, but also to in submissions to government when they're considering making changes under um, regulations. So the Transport Act, Farm Transport, is actually a federal issue. Um, they, uh, they did ha have a call for submissions recently. We put in our submissions. Um, I, I'm not going to lie, uh, some some improvements have been made in that area, but I definitely think this is an opportunity for Canadians going forward and supporters like yourself for when a call for, for future changes are, is made or we make that call, um, that I think there's a great deal of room for improvement there. Great. Thank you. And I think next we're going to go to Lois. Lois, is, do we have Lois on the line? Oh, we may have may have lost her. I think what we'll do is go to um, one of our online questions now because we have people um, calling in online. So I think, uh, or calling in online, <laughs> whatever online. I think Marcy, you have a question from Nathan online. Sure. So Nathan's question was, what steps has the SPCA taken to lobby the province to impose tougher sentences or laws for animal abusers? Um, great question, Nathan. I can definitely point back over um, my time at the BC SPCA to a number of changes um, that have been made to our provincial legislation and criminal code legislation back in, uh, just off the top of my head, 2011, 2012, and 2015, that saw changes to our provincial act um, to increase the penalties there 
and changes were made under the criminal code. So now the maximum penalty um, under either of those acts combined would be up to five years in jail and up to a $70,000 fine $75,000 fine, sorry, and up to a lifetime ban on animals, uh, animal ownership in the future. Uh, so I think penalties are one are one step, um, but I'm really proud of the work that we're doing uh, to work with Crown Council to provide resources and training in the area of animal cruelty prosecutions because uh, I will admit, you know, you can have the highest penalties on paper, but if they're not actually being prosecuted and, um, you know, uh, that case law is not being made aware um, for judges, it doesn't make as much of a difference. So we are working um, in partnership again with um, Humane Canada, our national body, to train Crown Council um, in this area or provide resources, I guess, in the area of animal cruelty prosecution so that we are seeing um, uh, more consistent and fair sentences across Canada. So thank you so much for, for that question. And absolutely, we will continue to advocate uh, in, for animals in this area. It's really, imp really important. And I think next we have uh, Shauna from Lady Smith on the line. Do we have Shauna from Lady Smith with a question? Hi, guys. Hi. Um, you guys rock my world. All my animals that I've ever had are from the SPCA. Um, you care and nurture, and every time I go in there, I cry. So sh don't tell anyone. Um, I want to take everyone home. Uh, not you guys, though. Um, I just, <laughs> We're not so cute as the puppy the kid. <laughs> no, you're right. Um, I just want to I, thank you, Nathan. That was kind of one of my questions as well is I would prefer jail time for these guys um, as opposed to fines and you know how do we know that they're not going to own an animal again um, so thank you Nathan for that I was going to ask about uh, the um, percentage of all my donations what what percentage uh, do they go to the animals? And I looked online, and you guys, 75% of everything that I donate goes to programs. And you you explained earlier about the programs. Um, I appreciate that too. What about um, I don't I I was gonna. Do you have an, an emergency number that? I can reach you at night. Uh, for example, hello, Shauna. Okay, we seem to have we seem to have, have lost Shauna, um, and I will we'll try and get her back on. And um, I'm sorry about that. So sorry, Shauna. We'll try and get you back on. Uh, while we're, we're waiting for that, I think we have, is it Monica from Maple Ridge? Oh, we're just... Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 I, um, I have a question for Craig. Um, Craig, you know, in the coming year, what are what do you see as the top three challenges for the SPCA? Thank you, Monica. You, so you put me on the spot, right? Yeah, this um, top three. Okay, so I, you know, I, I would say um, the 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 priority that um, the organisation has had uh, for as long as I've been with the organisation, even before, um, it really has to be around our enforcement role. Um, this really is the 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 foundation of the the organisation, and I believe very strongly. Um, in the role that we play in, in enforcement. Uh, there's been lots of changes in enforcement across Canada over the last year or so. Some organizations like our counterparts in the Ontario, uh, at the Ontario SPC have decided to actually uh, step away from enforcement. We feel very strongly that enforcement uh, is something that we uh, do well and should continue to do. Uh, and so I would say that that certainly is one of our, our primary uh, priorities uh, in, in the province. And as I mentioned earlier on, adding constables in some of the more remote and rural parts of the province where our response times um, are, are longer than we'd like them to be. And so by adding constables to those areas, I th we're, we're really hopeful that uh, we'll see 
uh, sh shorter response times. The other two areas, quite frankly, are, are really about our prevention role. And, and I see that the only way that we ultimately solve problems is through education and through advocacy. And uh, uh, one of the things I, I, I'm, I feel that we, where we've made a lot of progress is in this uh, advocating for change. Um, I've been two, two decades now in the animal welfare sector, and whilst we've seen a lot of change, positive change provincially, we hadn't seen that same change federally. And so the changes that were made this past year federally are the real shot in the arm, and, and it's, a, it's a testament, I think, to the importance that the public attaches to animal issues. And so I'm, I'm, I think that's an area that we need to continue to work on. And then finally, uh, education. Ultimately, you know, it's our function to make sure, our responsibility to make sure that the next wave of animal ambassadors uh, can join the, the fight for, for animal protection. So increasing our work for, for youth, doing more uh, adult education, uh, I think is going to be critical for us going forward. And Hopefully, uh, with the support of British Columbians, we'll be able to continue to make inroads. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. Just in case we don't get Shauna back, I think she was asking for a number to call, and I just want to give our, our toll-free animal helpline, which is one eight five five six two two. 7722 if one uh, sees an animal being mistreated and, and wants to, to report or get help. Now, this uh, our helpline is entirely uh, funded by donors. It's not at this point a 24-hour helpline, and so there'll, there'll be some times where you'll receive a message to, to call your local RCMP or, or police detachment. But that is where, we, uh, where most of our cruelty investigations start, by a good Samaritan calling in and reporting. So thank you to everyone who's, who's ever done that. So I think we have the results from our second poll about having an emergency plan and kit. Uh, Craig, would you share the results with everyone on the phone? Yeah, sure, and thank you everyone for participating. So the question was uh, that Mossy Post was she was wondering if you have an emergency plan for your animals, and so uh, five percent of you said no, but I'm going to look into creating one uh, soon so that I'm prepared. Uh, Thirty-seven percent of you said no, but I'd like some guidance from the BCSPCA to help me be ready. Uh, Twenty-five percent of you said sort of I have a plan, but no kit ready yet. 14% uh, said, yes, I have a plan and an emergency kit ready to go at any time. And 19% of you said, I currently don't have any animals in my life, but I'm interested in helping my friends and family prepare. So thank you for that information. It's actually really helpful in, in terms of, of uh, looking at our own response to emergencies. Thank you. And thank you, everyone who, who participated. We've got some great emergency preparedness resources. And if you indicated that you're interested in receiving gui guidance, we'll be connecting with you to, to get those out um, either by email or letting you know where you can find them. If you, um, and if you uh, didn't uh, indicate that but still like to get some information, you can leave a message at the end of the call tonight and, and let us know. So I can see we've got more people on the line with questions, so let's get back to the lines. We have Florence on the line from Richmond. Florence, uh, you have a question? Yes, hi everyone, good evening. Um, good evening. I would, like to, uh, I would actually like to understand um, what kind of steps and what um, proactive um, processes uh, the SPCA has been having with um, the real estate community and maybe the provincial government um, in helping to remove the ridiculous um, companion animals restriction pet policies here in BC um, across the rental homes. Hi, Florence. It's Marcy here. You you absolutely raise a, a very important issue, um, one that as an organization we've been grappling with for some time. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll maybe take it in a, a 
a few parts here. Um, we have developed uh, tools in house. We have a pet, um, a pet rental pet housing toolkit online, which can help when you're approaching a landlord um, as to why uh, they should consider your pet um, uh, as being a valuable addition and and you being a, um, a, a some of the they should want to rent to. And that kit has great um, tool, uh, templates, for example, for references um, from veterinarians. And we have uh, had many people have success in approaching um, pet friendly or not previously not pet friendly buildings or um, uh, to, to get their pet accepted. So that's on the one side of things. And you can visit our website to find that resource. But we've absolutely done some advocating um, to to see those types of changes. I, I know that in Ontario, it's specifically within the provincial um, realm and legislation that, that does prohibit um, or, or make it illegal to uh, discriminate against people with pets. We haven't, as um, to date, seen much success on a provincial level with seeing this kind of change happen in BC, but it's absolutely um, not off our radar. We have, though, um, had some success in approaching some of the different housing agencies, so um, some of the low-income uh, low housing and through BC Housing, to change their policies and to work with them so that their new buildings or their current existing buildings allow for pets and also have some uh, proactive um, strategies and policies around uh, how those pets are being kept in that housing. So I think we, we all have a, um, a ways to go and a part to play um, on this issue and who knows there may be an action alert call out in the future. So make sure you, you lend your name to the action alerts um, and uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have Catherine on the phone from Victoria. Catherine, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for taking my call. Um, my question is, is regarding the use of pesticides for rat control in my particular neighborhood. Um, one of my neighbors was saying that she um, had a, a licensed person come in because she was having rats. And I, I said, well, you know, but, but, but my, our cats, um, several in the neighborhood are indoor-outdoor cats. And um, I was saying that I was concerned that they would eat maybe a cat or rat and be poisoned. And um, and apparently it's warfarin or something. It's, I, I would love to find out a way to make that illegal to protect our kitties. Um, actually, one of um, two of my cats passed away this summer from kidney issues. And I, I didn't have them tested, but I was certainly wondering whether it had anything to do with them ingesting a, a rat or or a critter um, that they'd caught. Is there anything that I can do um, to support, you know, the not using pesticides for that sort of um, pest control? Hi, Catherine. It's Marcy here. First, I'm sorry to hear about the passing of your two cats. Um, it, I'm going to approach it from a slightly different uh, side of things because you raise a very, very important issue, um, and I'm so excited to say that the BCSPC, I think, is a well, it's a world leader in this, um, and it's the issue. I'm approaching it from the pest control, um, a wildlife control side of things, and having more positive, uh, animal friendly, and with the benefit of um, the pesticide issue of rats or other types of pests being ingested by domestic animals, um, is also uh, addressed in that. We have a program called Animal Kind, and this program, um, we uh, currently we have two, two programs running. One is for pest control companies, um, and we have uh, standards for pest control based on science-based uh, science evidence um, as to the most humane ways to deal with, for example, um, you know, mice or rat infestation, whether it's raccoons in your attic, and uh, we're very excited to see um, a number of companies sign on, and we're looking to to see more companies join that so that when a neighbor um, or a, a strata building or even a city, Vancouver actually just um, uh, took a very proactive step of um, putting in an animal welfare uh, friendly procurement policy um, so that when they are um, contracting on certain um, contracts, which could include pest control, they have to consider animal welfare friendly methods. And so Animal Kind uh, gives that opportunity to promote those types of companies. We also, too, have an Animal Kind dog training, um, which, again, has certain standards. But So I, I hope I got to 
that question a little bit around the, the ways, but you can promote, I think, um, more friendly animal welfare policy uh, use for, for pest control, and that can help with um, the ingestion of pesticides. Thank you so much. I think this is one of those areas where we really see how important uh, consumer demand is. If the people are asking questions of the wildlife control companies, they will start looking towards more humane options. So it's great that we have people like you asking those questions. I think we have, uh, I'll take one more question uh, for now. We have Ashling on the phone. Uh, have we Lydia, got I'm just calling here? because, yeah. Hello. Hello. Good evening. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, hi. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm calling from Port Moody, and my question is, uh, how does how is the SPCA involved with the BC Conservation Service in the handling of wildlife such as bears? Because lately, I'm sure we've all heard in the news, sort of a lot of people would say the inhumane handling of some of the cubs um, going to places like Critter Care. And so I was wondering how the SPCA um, is influ influences in any way the BC Conservation Service to treat these animals more humanely. And also thank you for all you do. <laughs> thank you. I think it's Marcy here. I'll, I'll try and answer that. You've definitely raised um, an issue. I'll start with how the BC SPCA sort of works with conservation um, in uh, on a more broader scale. We, we sometimes work with conservation through our cruelty investigations work. I will say our Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act does not apply to wildlife um, not in captivity. But, but what you are mentioning is wildlife, bears in particular, in captivity. And we absolutely advocate for um, the most humane handling um, in those types of situations. I'm very fortunate to work with um, some wildlife experts um, on our team uh, who, who do advocate and put out um, calls to whether it is the ministry um, on, on a provincial level working with conservation uh, on those issues. I can't specifically um, right at the moment speak to the issue with respect to the bears uh, in Port Moody that you're speaking about, but we would, you know, if, if we do get a complaint with respect to um, concerns that best practices are not being adhered to um, with respect to the care or capture of wild animals, um, we most certainly um, would would look into it. These are some really great questions. I th we're going to take a, a break uh, before hopefully a few last questions. I think, Craig, you wanted to um, at ask one more poll this evening. Yeah, these have been really great questions, so thank you everyone for them and keep them coming, please. So uh, we would certainly like a little bit more feedback, so we, we'd like to add one more poll before we take some more questions. So uh, what I'd like to do, um, I'd like to know who on tonight's call would like for us to con them, contact them directly whenever we need your voice to help speak for animals. And I, I'll repeat the choices we're going to have. So press 1 for yes, please, or press 2 for no, thank you. So really what we're trying to find out, for, for those of you on the call tonight, would you like us to contact you directly whenever we need your voice to help speak for animals? So uh, press 1 for yes, or um, press 2 for no, thank you. Great. Thanks, Craig. Um, that, I'm looking forward to um, the responses from, um, from that poll, because as you've heard tonight, the voices of animal lovers are, are absolutely key to improving our laws and making animal lives better. And from the questions that we're getting, I, I'm definitely seeing that um, this is a priority um, for, for those of you on the line and other animal lovers in BC. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. We do have time for probably a few more questions. Um, so let's get straight to those. We have Sandy on the line. Uh, Sandy from the Gulf Islands. Hi. Evening, um, Hi. First of all, thank you for all you do. Um, my question is, I've always been curious when um, a person is convicted of animal cruelty and they get their sentences not, uh, that they can't ban, they can't own an animal for X number of years or forever. 
how is that enforced? And, and what if the person moves from where they live, moves to another city or town, or even moves out of the province? So how is the ban enforced, and who is it enforced by, and how do you do it? Hi, Sandy. I'll take that one. Uh, the uh, Definitely the million-dollar question, I can say. Um, I've been asked this a number of times. And, uh, you know, the reality is we just have uh, 34 full-time special provincial constables to respond to 8,000 cruelty cl- complaints uh, across the province, and, and that's all funded by donors like yourself. So I, I'm not going to lie and say that, oh, we have the, the team capacity to do um, necessarily proactive um, monitoring monitoring of people who have uh, bans on owning animals. But but what I will say, though, is that what's so fantastic in this day and age of social media um, and a very active and engaged public is that I'm super confident that, that these types of bans work um, because they work because neighbors call in. They work because uh, I've had an instance where somebody was in a job interview and they mentioned they had pets and the employer had Googled the individual um, just to do their, their background and, and they came up with a, a, our media release that said that this person had been banned from owning pets. So uh, we really do rely on um, neighbors. We, that's why part of the reason why we do um, media around it in the first place is to make sure that this information gets out there. We we also do, we're working with police um, agencies and, and RCMP to make sure that when somebody is convicted and gets a ban like that, that sentence is on their what's called their Justin record, or it can be pulled up by police forces. So we've had cases where police have pulled over somebody for a speeding ticket, and they happen to have a dog sitting next to them in the car, and they'll go back to their cruiser and find out, oh, that person has a ban on owning animals. So for me, it's one of the most important aspects of any sentence, and um, we're continuing to try and ensure that uh, we can hold those people accountable. So thanks for that question. And Marcy, one of my understandings is that sometimes at the beginning it can be really difficult to get a warrant because we have to have a, enough evidence once someone has a ban that if it is reported, merely the fact that they have an animal then becomes cause for further investigation. Is that correct? You raise an interesting point. Um, the reality is that would be a breach of a court order, and so they, we could recommend charges and Crown Council would follow up on the fact that they're breaching their court order. Um, Oftentimes, though, that animal is also found to be in distress, and then we can take action. But we can't actually seize an animal from a person simply um, because they have a ban. But we go about it. But you can't go in and see the animal. Uh, Yeah, we we can definitely approach it from a different angle. Okay. Excellent. And we have uh, Jana on the line. A question uh, from Jana. Are you there? Hi. Hi. I am. Thank you for taking my call and thank you for everything you do. Uh, part of my question was answered by uh, Monica's question to Craig about the top three challenges, but I was looking at your uh, strategic plan for tw- uh, 2019 to 23, and you've outlined um, a few broad categories and a few initiatives under each. My question is really about how you decide as an organization that has been through many years, 125 apparently, of growth and maturity. As you grow and mature into this organization, that it kind of has top-line priorities around enforcement, prevention, education, advocacy, et cetera. How do you decide about allocating resources and uh, focus, particularly money, into the impact you're trying to create in each of those areas? How does that decision-making process unfold um, at the high level? And what does that mean for on the ground sort of grassroots movements that are sort of evolving and maybe occupying part of the space that you would have um, um, taken in maybe 20 or 30 years in the past? Like how do you foster that new, um, the development of those new organizations that take those spaces? Thanks so much for your question. So, uh, and thank you for, for going online and, and looking at a copy of our strategic plan and I would encourage anyone who's looking for more information on our strategic plan it it is actually available online um so one of I think one of my biggest challenges as CEO is um is helping to shape the the annual budget that we develop every single year so we will go through a process um that involves every one of our branches and every one of our departments um in terms of which we will ask for 
um, priorities to be identified. That they have to be consistent with our strategic plan. But we ask our branches and our various departments to bring forward uh, priorities. <coughs> uh, once we get that uh, and we consolidate them all together, we're looking where possible for themes. And um, and then also uh, uh, ensuring that, um, you know, how, how can we fund projects sustainably over the long time? So one of the, that that's an important factor for us uh, before we decide that we're going to embark upon something new is we want to make sure that if we do so, we're not just doing it for one year, we're able to sustain that over the long term. Uh, the, invariably, we get far more requests uh, to fund things than we have uh, funding available for. Uh, but um, at the end of the day, we, we put forward a, a bunch of priorities to our uh, board of directors. Our board is a volunteer board uh, made up of representatives from all across the province. And we have a, a, we have a dialogue with our board over the course of a number of months around um, areas that they feel strongly about uh, the need for funding uh, and as a staff group, the, the work that we feel needs to be funded and then ultimately arrive at a point where we we, we look at the, our projected revenue coming in, in in the upcoming year and match our expenses uh, to that particular area. It can be a real challenge, uh, I will say, because uh, there's some great programs that we would love to fund. Uh, but uh, one of the things that, that we know is that um, there are a bunch of emerging animal welfare issues, and so it, it's been wonderful to see over the, the two years that uh, the two decades that I've been in animal welfare. Um, you know, 20 years ago we had a massive dog and cat overpopulation problem, and thankfully today we don't have those same issues. We have uh, a lot of the animals that are coming to us come in because they have behavioural needs uh, and behavioural challenges. And so, as an organisation, uh, when we look to uh, addressing that issue one of the recognitions we've had is that we actually need to make sure that we have more staff um, on who can support the behavioral needs of those animals um, and then also uh, recognizing that we have an army of volunteers uh, nearly 5,500 5, of them and so um, one of the things that we've done this year for instance is to provide more resources to support volunteerism in the organization so uh, that, that's sort of a, a quick snapshot of how we do our budget process on, a, on an annual basis. Thank you, Craig. It's really a, a strange balancing act of helping individual animals and changing the futures for hundreds of thousands of animals at once, and it's, it's, it's quite the process to do. I think we're just going to sneak in one last online question that I've passed over to Marcy, and then that's going to be a wrap for tonight. Marcy, do you want to take this last online question? Sure. So this question is from Kristen, and her question is, the SPCA deals primarily with domestic animals. Is there an agency that helps injured wildlife? Well, actually, Kristen, I'm very happy to say that part of um, our, our mission is not only, of course, helping domestic animals, but it's helping both farm and wildlife. And so we uh, we do run a um, an incredible uh, wildlife rehabilitation um, center, um, really a top of its a class um, in Machosan called Wild Ark, where we help thousands of injured wildlife each, each year. Uh, it's an incredible um, operation that is really driven by volunteer work and um, while it is close to the public most of the year um, we do have open houses and I really encourage you to check out our website um, and you can look up wildlife you can also uh, be part of a newsletter called uh, Wild Sense where you'll get updates on the BCSPCA's wildlife uh, rehabilitation work and also the wildlife advocacy work that we do so um, it, it's something we're very proud of yeah, Marcy, if I could just jump in there. I just uh so Marcy's spoken about the work uh of Wild Oak in on Vancouver Island. Uh I, I will do just quickly want to mention that part of our long term strategy is to um provide a and and open a wildlife uh, rehabilitation center in the Okanagan. Um and uh you know that's uh that's a work in progress but uh we feel very strongly that there is simply insufficient. Uh, there, There is no wildlife facility in the Okanagan and we feel very strongly that over the course of the next number of years we need to fill that gap that exists. 
Thank you. And thank you so much to everybody on the phone. This has been a really wonderful opportunity for us to hear your questions and your input. I have really enjoyed it tremendously, and I hope you all did also. When I think about the difference you've had in the lives of animals, I'm, I'm so hopeful for the future. Together, we're really a, a tremendous team, and we're, uh, we've, as you've heard tonight, there's been some great victories for animals. So thank you very much for working together to make this happen. Remember to stay on the line if you still have questions or to leave your email. And Craig and Marcy and I would like to thank everybody who joined us tonight. Have a great evening. Good night, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone, for your support. Good night. Good night.